thanks for the very succinct intro. <laughs> um, so I hope you all like CSS because um, we've got another CSS talk following Andy's. Um, we always seem to be following each other at conferences. So Andy described us yesterday as the tall villain zine of CSS, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about Andy's pop culture references. <laughs> but <laughs> at least, you know, it could be worse. We could be the Liz and Quasi. <laughs> but um. Uh, so, <laughs> today let's talk about uh, CSS layout in 2022. So we're going to be talking about some of the features that we currently have at our disposal, um, some that are just landing in browsers now, and some creative ways we can use them to build, build layouts suitable for an era where how we browse the web is more flexible than ever. So I am a front-end developer at Ada Mode, a data science and AI company working in the renewable energy sector. And I also write a lot about CSS um, and web development in general on my blog, CSS in Real Life, um, which some of you may have com come across before. And right now is a really, really exciting time for CSS. There are tons of new features to get excited about, as we've seen um, from like, some of the talks earlier. Oh, this is like an interesting glitch effect that was that's not on my slides, but it's... it's <laughs> 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 but it looks very cool, right? I, I'm not going to be explaining how we can do that in CSS, because as far as I'm aware, we can't. But anyway, it looks very cool. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yes, um, so lots and lots of exciting new CSS features. We've, we've seen some of those in action in some of the talks earlier. Um, and um, in some of Jay's videos as well, really, really exciting stuff. But it's not always easy to keep up with this stuff. Um, so hopefully this talk will give you a bit more of an understanding of what's new in CSS layout and where certain features might come in useful. So it's pretty incredible to think that up until Flexbox in 2012, we didn't really have a good way of doing kind of creative layout on the web. We sort of hacked around with tables, um, and then you know later on we learned about you know semantics and started <coughs> using floats. But those were most definitely hacks. We were not using you know the, those things for the purpose which they were intended for. And that's because we didn't really have any other option. Um, so then Flexbox came along, um, and that was you know, a big jump forward for CSS layouts. Um, then you know, since then, we had viewport units. Uh, we had multi-column layout. Then um, CSS Grid came along. And um, that was a huge game changer. And to me, personally, that really spoke to me. As someone coming from a design background, that felt like the way we should be doing the layout on the web. And custom properties dropped around the same time, um, not specific to CSS layouts, but super useful, um, as we've seen from Andy's talk and some of um, the talks earlier. They can really help us with our layouts. Um, and then, you know, since then, we've had logical properties, writing modes, min, max, and clamp functions, and aspect ratio. There's probably some more that I'm missing on here. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of these um, a little bit later on. And now we have some even more exciting features. We have container queries landing in browsers now. Um, we already, they already have um, support in quite a few browsers, um, something developers have been asking for for a really long time. We have the has pseudo class or parent selector, as Jay has talked about. And we have subgrid, um, part of, well, it's the long-awaited sequel to the CSS grid level one specification. Um, it's been supported in Firefox for a while, and now that's starting to land in other browsers too. Other browsers are catching it. And of course, there are more devices around today than ever before. We can't possibly know the exact dimensions of the device that a user is using. So hopefully the days of building for fixed breakpoints are long gone. And many CSS features, or many of the new CSS features, help us embrace this more flexible mindset. And they work a lot better when we do. So Jen Simmons refers to intrinsic web design to describe a new era of CSS layout beyond responsive design, using the web as a medium in its own right, rather than trying to emulate print design. So where the focus is on being fluid and adaptable, responding to contents and context, while still being able to be really creative with our layouts too. So with our current set of CSS features, we can build most layouts now. But it's a question of picking the right tool for the job. 
And a question that comes a lot up a lot, or that I see come up a lot, is should I use flex or grid for a layout? And a lot of, lot of the time the answer is either or both. So when grid was released, I feel like a lot of people thought it would replace Flexbox. And it's true it replaces Flexbox in some situations because before Grid came along, we were building layouts with Flexbox that weren't necessarily well suited to it, but it was the best option we had at the time. So some layouts are clearly better built with one or the other, um, but the other layouts could conceivably be built with either or even both. And their uses actually overlap quite a bit. So Grid is generally a better choice for two-dimensional layouts. Flexbox only permits us to lay out items on a single dimension, but Grid can do one-dimensional layout too. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because the layout you're building has a single dimension that you can't use Grid, because of course you can. I've also you know, heard it said that Grid is better for page layout and Flexbox is better for components, but again, that's not really true. So for plenty of components, Grid would be the better choice. And now Flexbox has gap support, so the line is even more blurred. But you might think, looking at this diagram, that you should be using Grid way more than Flexbox, but actually, I probably use Flexbox way more. So if I was building this kind of wrapping menu layout, I would almost definitely opt for Flexbox. So we can see that as we resize the browser, as we get down to the small viewport sizes, those items just wrap naturally onto the next line. And that's you know, using three lines of code with Flexbox. So that's super easy. If we tried to build the same thing with Grid, those items are always going to be aligned in rows and columns, and we would need to do like a little bit more work to make it responsive. Um, but you know, maybe that's the design you're going for. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Let's make, oh, that's pretty. Okay, <laughs> um, maybe I'm stepping on some cables. Okay, uh, so <laughs> um, there are advantages and disadvantages for both, but to me, to me, this works pretty well with Flexbox. But what about if we have this kind of header layout? So we have a um, logo or home link over on the left. We have a kind of user area and shopping cart button on the right. And then we have this um, navigation, which needs to be centered within the viewport. So perhaps you look at this and think, okay, this looks like a clear-cut case for Flexbox um, because you know it's just items on a single dimension. They need to be um, aligned horizontally. Pretty easy, right? So if we use Flexbox and we use the justify content property, then what that's going to do is, um, if we use space between, is try and um, distribute the spacing evenly between items. So you know this kind of looks okay, but actually that navigation is sat off to the left rather than being centered within the viewport uh, because that spacing is being evenly distributed. But instead, if we use grid for that, this layout, then we'll, we can actually center that navigation within the viewport. So we use one FR tracks, uh, so flexible tracks for our uh, left and right columns, and then auto for our central column. And then we can get our content centered in the middle there. So when we want to align things evenly, Grid is pretty good at doing that for us. But we're probably going to want to use Flexbox for some of the content inside this. So for the user shopping cart area and um, probably for that navigation too. So we still get that like, nice wrapping behavior that we saw a moment ago. Now, if I was building this kind of layout on the other hand, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, another unintentional glitchy layout, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so I would probably almost definitely opt for grid with this. Oops. I'm going to try plugging in a different adapter and seeing if that works. Should we try that? Okay. <laughs> right, let's do this. This is where I break everything. Okay, no, same issue. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> so, that's okay. Uh, you can still see that, right? Okay, <laughs> let's carry on. So, something like this. I'm probably going to use grid or nothing at all. I don't know. <laughs> so, it has two dimensions. It has overlapping items. It's much more of 
<laughs> a prescriptive kind of art directed layout. Each item needs to be positioned rather than just letting content flow into the grid organically. Um, so if I uh, switch on the grid inspector, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what we can we can do about this. So apologies, everyone. Um, are we all um, are, are the cables all okay? <laughs> I tried it with that. I, I yeah. tried it with that one as well, but it didn't make any difference. It took a moment. Didn't it? I, I, yeah, I don't know if it's. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's where I'm putting my feet. <laughs> okay, right, foot is staying here. I can't, no. <laughs> the one I was using before. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Okay, right, we will carry on. Let's do this. <laughs> Your clapping was premature. <laughs> right, okay, let's, uh, let's just try and carry on and see how we get on. So um, we can inspect our grid with the grid inspector in, uh, in Firefox or in Chrome. And in fact, I think pretty much any browser has the grid inspector here. So we can see that this is like a tw 12 column grid. <laughs> um, Okay, <laughs> and as long as we use flexible grid row tracks, our layout is still going to adapt to the content. So we can have a longer heading um, or change the length of the block quote or even the dimensions of the image and our grid is still going to respond accordingly. We're not gonna have items like crashing into each other because we're not setting any fixed heights on anything. And you know, we could build this in other ways perhaps, but in my opinion, grid gives us the most flexibility um, because we can also create different variants um, of this component pretty easily just by positioning items differently on the grid. So you can imagine if we have like a big long web page of all these different ty types of components, then we can create much more visual interest just by changing um, the grid tracks which each of these items are sitting on. Now, here's another example of the kind of UI, UI challenge that grid is great for solving. So we have um, these components where some elements need to align to a central wrapper, so the headings, the paragraphs of text, and some of the images if we scroll further down. Um, whereas other elements need to break out and align to the edge of the viewport, so those images in the top two components, for example. Now we can use grid with a mixture of flexible and max width constrained column tracks. Um, so these uh, two outer columns are flexible. I call this a concertina grid. These are two flexible columns using the FR unit, and they'll shrink or expand to the edge of the viewport while the others stay fixed. Um, so, you know, building this kind of layout would not be very practical with flexbox um, or, you know, other layout methods. To me, this is like the perfect, grid is the perfect choice for this. Um, so if we resize the browser, we can see um, those outer column tracks collapse first while the inner ones retain their widths. <laughs> or not. I think it might be where I'm standing, you know. Um, and then once those outer tracks hit zero, then the inner columns start collapsing too. Uh, so um, that works pretty cool. It's quite like quite responsive down to we get down to a sort of mid, you know, small tablet size. And then once, once we get to kind of mobile sizes, we probably want, <laughs> okay? We probably want to sort of start stacking those um, items anyway. 
Um, sorry, is this going to be really distracting? I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> Thank you. Well, just imagine you can see a website. <laughs> So since Grid, there have been a few more CSS features that work in harmony with our Flex and Grid layouts in order to solve common CSS problems. I love the aspect ratio property because with a single line of CSS, it eliminates the need for a whole lot of hacky code. So on the left was basically the simplest way to set an aspect ratio on an element before 2021. We used to call this the padding hack for very fa fairly obvious reasons. We had like a pseudo element with some like top or bottom padding set on it, and then we had the absolute position, the first child element. Like really, really horrible CSS. Nobody wants to have to be writing this. Uh, but in 2022, all we need is this one line of CSS, the aspect ratio property. And it works great with our flex and grid layouts, especially if we combine it with object fit when working with images. So each of the items in this grid has an aspect ratio of one, making it a square. And by the way, we can use um, the uh, previous syntax of two numbers separated by a slash, or we can use a decimal. So um, an aspect ratio of 1.5 is equivalent to three slash two. Both are valid. Thank you. I've just to the noticed tech crew. these slides match your hair. Yeah. Wow. It is the branding. Fantastic. <laughs> hair branded slides. Love it. Thank um, you, Michelle. Cool. The great thing is we haven't even lost any time because Andy has already done half my talk. So I get to <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna miss out that whole chunk and, oh, and happy days. <laughs> So where did we get to? We're going to set aspect ratio um, of one on those items, so they're going to be a square. And then we can set object fit with the value of cover. And then those images will cover our square items, no matter what their original dimensions, which is very nice. Or if we have something like a logo grid, we could set um, object fit to contain. And then those logos can be nicely centered within their squares um, without any cropping happening. So that's pretty cool. Now, oh, I just realized I've lost my speaker notes, so that's fun. <laughs> Bear with me a moment. So we could, ju we could just, you know, at this point, I'm like, we could just uh, do, it all, do it all without notes. Let's go freestyle. <laughs> uh, let's stop mirroring. I think that's for the best. We don't want to do that. OK, yay. Um, <laughs> and then we've got to put mirroring back on in a minute. So another adventure waiting to happen. <laughs> so the great thing about aspect ratio, uh, sorry to keep banging on about aspect ratio. See how many times I can say the words aspect ratio in this segment. Um, the great thing is it acts like a minimum or a suggested aspect ratio. So um, this one has an aspect ratio of three, two. But if I stick in some longer text content, and that box is just going to grow to accommodate the content. So it's not like setting a fixed height on something. It's just going to grow to accommodate it. And that flexibility is pretty handy. So if we have this card layout, we have the image on the left uh, where we're set setting the aspect ratio um, of three, two. So that means that image is always going to be at least that aspect ratio. That's, that's kind of the minimum. But then if we put some longer text content on the right hand side, then that image is just going to get, grow taller to match it, uh, which is you know, pretty much how we want it to behave in this situation. So um, that's pretty nice. Um, and that's because uh, we're using flex or grid um, to um, lay out this card. And those items by, a de by default have an align value of stretch. So um, this, uh, both columns are going to grow to match the tallest one. If we didn't want this kind of behavior, we could just set align self on the image, give it a value of you know, start, end, or center, however, however we want to align it. Um, and then we're not going to get that kind of stretching behavior anymore. Um, but for this kind of card layout, this is pretty much perfect. And it's also possible to set an aspect ratio on an entire grid. So these grids um, each have two rows, and the aspect ratio is set on the grid itself. Each one has an aspect ratio of 3, 2. I don't know why I keep picking 3, 2. It just fits nicely <laughs> in, in most screens. So, um, and we're using FR tracks for the grid um, column and row tracks. 
And you can see I'm just packing different numbers of items into that grip. Um, because um, that, that aspect ratio is set on the grid itself, we don't have to worry about setting an aspect ratio on those individual items and tweaking them you know, if they span different numbers of rows or columns. Um, because we're using FR tracks, they're just going to fill the space, which is quite nice. And this works pretty well for you know, something like a thumbnail gallery, which is exactly where I've used this kind of um, behavior before. Now, let's talk about min, max, and clamp functions, or rather not talk about them very much because Andy has mostly talked about clamp already, so he has done the job for me, so thank you, Andy. <laughs> but we are going to touch on them very briefly because they become a lot more relevant later on. So um, min takes two values and it will pick um, the smallest of those. So if one rem is smaller than two VW, viewport width units, it's going to pick one rem. Otherwise, it will pick two VW. Um, max it will do the opposite. It will pick, pick the largest of those two. And these have been around in CSS for a little while now. Um, and clamp takes three values and it will pick the middle one. So um, if we gave it one rem, two rem, and three rem, then it's, it's just going to pick two rems every time because that's always going to be the middle one. But the magic happens when we give it a fluid value like two VW, two viewport width units. So, you know, sometimes it's going to evaluate to one rem, sometimes it's going to be three rems, and sometimes it's going to be that fluid viewport-based sizing. So, as we saw, that's really useful for, um, control for uh, fluid typography and also controlling layout and vertical rhythm um, across our site. So, we could um, set a bunch of custom properties at the root level and use them, them everywhere. So I'm set, I've created this um, pad variable, short for padding. You can call it whatever you want, using, <laughs> using clamp. <laughs> and then um, I've created um, some like, subdivisions of that original padding variable. So we've got large, small, extra small. And they're just calculated from our original um, variable. Um, so, you know, the only place we're actually changing anything is in that original clamp function. And I love how fluid this makes our layout. So, as we saw from um, Andy's talk, we can do uh, this kind of flow utility um, and, and set the top margin on every element when it um, directly follows another one um, using our variable here. Um, or uh, we can use, um, instead of margin top, we could use margin block start, which is the logical property um, equivalent. Um, so if we're working in the default um, left to right or right to left writing mode, the, the block um, margin will be you know, top and bottom. Um, so using logical properties is something I'm kind of not really in the habit of using yet, but I'm trying to um, use them more and more in my CSS because actually um, for a lot of modern CSS, um, you know, it's these logical properties are far more relevant it, it, and, and new CSS features are kind of um, more, a bit more kind of logical property oriented. Uh, or, um, you know, we could override that, um, that spacing using one of our other variables um, if we want maybe like a bit uh, less space um, below the headings um, where we've got, you know, a paragraph of text following a heading. Um, and that's calculated from our original fluid size, so it will still scale. So as we saw, a large viewport sizes, um, it's gonna, this space is going to evaluate to three rams because we've got, it acts like a lock. It's not going to ever get bigger than that. Um, and mobile sizes, it's going to be one ram and no less. But in the middle, we've got that fluid sizing space on the viewport. And we can visualize that with this graph. Um, and, of course, um, as Andy mentioned, this website, Utopia, actually like, creates this scaling system for you. You just pass in um, the, your minim minimum and maximum viewport sizes and your multipliers, and it just you know, spits out a load of custom properties for you based on clamp um, that you can use everywhere for your fluid sizing. And, you know, what I really like about this is it allows you to say, I want this to start and stop scaling at these particular viewport sizes. So that's really handy. Uh, and instead of worrying about tweaking the padding on a bunch of elements at different breakpoints, just setting a few simple rules and letting the browser do its thing ensures our layouts are robust across all sizes and you know, hopefully reduces the amount of CSS we have to write. Now, if we're building just a really simple um, kind of card grid layout like this, what are we going to use, flex or grid? Um, so at this point, I always just like to have a show of hands out of curiosity. There's no right or wrong answer. Who would use Flexbox for this kind of layout? 
and who would use grid? And who would use something else completely? <laughs> yeah. I knew that would be one or two. <laughs> Hopefully not after this talk. <laughs> so you can use either. It really doesn't matter which one you pick because they're both capable of doing the job. I mean, me personally, like I feel like you know this is a grid layout. This my intuition says that I should be using grid here, um, but it's whatever works for you. But the thing to remember is that when you're using grid, um, you're putting the rules on the grid container, and the items just fall into line. Whereas with Flexbox, we're telling the individual items how to behave, how much stretchiness and squishiness they should have. And there's, there's, that's a subtle difference. Um, so for th this kind of layout, you know, doesn't really matter which one you choose, but it's worth bearing in mind those two kind of different models when you're working with flex, flex or grid, because that can help determine which one you pick for a particular task. But Flexbox kind of isn't really designed for building grid systems. So if you're building a grid system, um, personally, I would lean into using grid. But perhaps you might opt for Flexbox because you can make it responsive quite easily without any media queries, but we can do that with grid too. So this is where we get to hop on over to the browser and do, some, do a bit of coding. If we can mirror our display. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, sorry about this. My, uh, my shortcuts also stopped working, so <laughs> it's been a really fun day of tech <laughs> issues. <laughs> so we have um, this grid here on the left. Yeah, so in the left-hand sort of light blue area, we have this um, two-column grid, which is working pretty well for us when it's got you know all this space. But if we take the same grid and plop it into a narrow space, so this dark blue area on the right, we can see you know, we really don't want a two-column grid when it's in that narrow, narrow space. But a media query based on viewport size alone is not going to detect that our grid is in this narrow space. So what can we do instead? Well, we can use, instead of um, using a kind of fixed value, so two columns in our grid template columns property, we can use auto fill. Um, we can use auto fit instead. They do subtly different things. We're going to use auto fill this time. And then um, in, um, for the actual track size, we're going to use grid's min max function. So we're going to say a maximum of one FR, which was our original value, minimum of, let's say, 300 pixels. So yeah, okay, we kind of have a responsive grid. Works pretty well in that left-hand um, area there, the light blue area. Uh, not so well in the sidebar because those items are still too big. So let's go, you know, maybe 270. Starts to work a bit better for us. But even so, if we resize the browser, uh, once we hit really small screen sizes, we're still going to get overflow because our items have a minimum width on them. So what could we do instead? Well, we could use CSS's min function inside our min max function, which um, if you remember, so min function takes the min function takes two values and it will pick the smallest one. So if we give it 100% or 300 pixels, then that means if 100% is smaller than 300 pixels, it will pick 100%. Otherwise, it will pick 300 pixels. So yay, now we can see we have a responsive grid. So what's not to love about this ridiculous, horrible looking function? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> aside from it being ridiculous and horrible looking, when all we really want is a nice responsive grid, um, I think like, you know, if, I, if I write some code like this, I hand it over to um, you know, a team who are not experts in CSS, um, then a lot of people are going to take uh, one look at this and go, what the hell is going on here? Uh, so, you know, that's not an insurmountable problem. We could solve that with comments in our code, perhaps. Um, but the other thing that I don't like about this is it actually doesn't give us that much control over our grids. We can't go from, say, a two-column layout to a four-column layout. We always have to have those extra columns in between. So how can we improve on this? even further. 
Well, y the answer you might, may or may not be surprised to learn is with container queries, which are very exciting. <laughs> um, so um, container queries work a lot like media queries, except um, they uh, allow us to query a sort of a parent or ancestor element, so the container, rather than the viewport side. So let's, um, it, let's make this grid better with container queries. Oh, if I can spell. So we're going to um, set a container on the main and side element. Uh, so the main is the light blue area on the left, the side is the darker blue area on the right. We're going to use the container property, which is shorthand for container name and container type. Um, and we're going to call, call it um, layout, that will be our container's name. Um, if we don't want to give it a name, we could just use the container type property. Um, the advantage of giving it a name is that um, if we have nested containers, we might want to query a particular container. Um, so it's pretty handy. I always like to give my containers names. Um, and then the type is inline size. So that's almost always um, the, the container type that you want. Um, the other option is size, which I have yet to find a use for. Um, it kind of doesn't really do what you might think it does. Um, block size is not an option. So, um, so inline size is the, um, is the equivalent to the width if we're in the left to right or right to left writing mode. Block size would be the height. We cannot uh, currently query the block size. Um, but yeah, in 99% you know, of cases, inline size is probably what you want. So we have a container, and now let's write a container query. So we're going to use at container, so it's similar to writing a media query. So it's at container, we're going to use our container's name, and we're going to say if the inline size is greater than uh, 700 pixels, then we'll go to our two column layout. Um, let's copy and paste because I'm lazy. <laughs> and we'll go back to um, our original two column, nice and simple layout. So is that gonna work for us? Let's hope so. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I just need to make the window bigger. Um, okay, so um, oh, note here the new media query syntax. So um, we're saying like if the inline size is greater than 700 pixels, that's, that's kind of like saying you know, min width 700 pixels, except this is the logical property friendly version. Um, and this will be valid syntax in media queries as well. Um, it's currently, I believe, not supported in Safari, but um, other browsers. <laughs> no, no, it's okay because Safari is going to support. <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. I, I, feel, I feel bad, there's like lots of Safari bashing today. But actually Safari has some really great features and has had them before other browsers. So it's not all bad news, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> we can talk about that in the pub. <laughs> Uh, so, um, <laughs> so yes, you will be able to use that in, um, in media queries as well. So we, have, we now have a nice responsive grid with container queries, and you can see we've got that stacked um, layout in the right-hand column just as we want it. Now, wouldn't it be nice as well if when we get to sort of, you know, maybe this size, our items are kind of big, so maybe we want them to have a horizontal layout. So let's do that as well. And I need to remind myself what the actual class name is. So this time we're going to create a container on the um, grid child itself. So that's this, this class here that I'm just gonna grab. Um, so again, um, we give it a name. So the name, we'll call it cards and it will be inline size will be the type. Um, so we do need, when we are um, doing a container query, if I just give this a quickly, uh, a red background, uh, let's give it some padding as well. Um, we can see, so these are our containers now that we're querying. Um, we do need, a, so we do need like a wrapper element around the card to actually act as the container. We can't put the container query on the cards and then style the card. That, I mean, that would essentially be an element query and, and it basically just doesn't work because if you said like, you know, if the inline size is 
um, is less, you know, is greater than 600 pixels, make it 500 pixels. But that's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's it. you can see the obvious problems with that. <laughs> so we do need a wrapper element to be the container. Um, so we have our container. Now, again, let's do a container query on this card container. So, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's just uh, thinking about it, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, it's because I'm writing some broken CSS here. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> um, I shouldn't really have it auto refreshing because that's a recipe for disaster, but never mind. So we're going to say if the inline size is greater than, let's say, 400 pixels. Uh, let's make our card have a horizontal layout. So we already have um, flex box on here on these cards. So we're going to change flex direction to row. Um, so now, oh, that's pretty gross. <laughs> um, that's a little bit different than when I had it in the demo. But <laughs> um, let's um, do something about these images. Just let's stick a width on them rather than messing about too much. Yeah, that's a little bit nicer. So you can see we have a horizontal layout when we get to um, a certain point as well. So yay, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, wouldn't it also be kind of nice if we could scale the typography and the padding on our cards um, with the container as well? Because you know these ones on the left, they look like they could do with a bit of a bigger font size than the ones on the tiny area on the right. Well, we can do that as well with container units, which are just as exciting as container queries. Um, so we're basically going to do what Andy was doing with the fluid typography, but we're going to use container units. Um, so on the H3, which is the heading on our cards, we're going to set the font size using clamp. Um, we're going to say minimum of like, I don't know, 1.2 rand. I'm just freestyling these sizes. And then we're going to use container um, units. We're going to say for query container inline units. And we need the plus one rem to make it accessible so that the users can still uh, zoom, uh, increase or decrease the type size with the browser's zoom controls. And we're going to say maximum, I don't know, 2.8 rems. And now we should have some scalable typography based on clamp, which is, yay, very nice. Woo! <laughs> and then <laughs> we're going to do the same thing with some padding as well, uh, just to make that kind of nice. I'm going to, because I'm lazy, as we've established, let's uh, just copy and paste. We don't need the plus one RAM here because we're not doing any typography thing. So we're just going to do a few tweaks to that. and. Now we have um, the padding that's scaling as well. So yay, lovely, flexible things with container units and container queries, fun. So now we're gonna hop back to the browser. I'm gonna figure out how to unmirror, or figure out back to the presentation rather. Uh, so. Stop mirroring and we are back to the presentation, so container relative units. So we have um, a bunch of these, CQW and CQH are basically uh, query container width, query container height, equivalent to um, viewport width and viewport height, but relative to the container. Then we have CQI and CQB, so they're the logical property equivalents. So inline size and block size, we were using CQI inline size there. And then CQ min and CQ max, are uh, um, basically you know, equivalent to vmin and vmax. They'll pick the smallest and largest, respectively, of the inline size and block size. So browser support, container queries and container units are supported in Chrome, Edge, Safari, <laughs> <laughs> um, and not Firefox, sadly, but um, they are coming to Firefox. All browsers are actively working on this stuff. In the meantime, there is a container query polyfill courtesy of the Chrome team. Um, this works really, really well. It's just you know super easy to use. Um, it works for container units as well. Um, you just import it. It does its thing. It's, it's great. <laughs> um, so yes, if you do want to start using container queries, you basically can do today. Now, subgrid. We talk a lot about grid layouts, 
Um, so subgrid is part of the level two grid specification and Firefox has had it for ages, but other browsers are now prioritizing this as well. Um, so let's have a quick look at what it will help us achieve with our layouts. The subgrid allows any of a grid's children to inherit the parent grid. So an example is if we have these two cards, they have different content in the top section, in the middle, and at the bottom, but we want each of those sections to align with each other. Now, without subgrid, neither card is aware of the other one's content, but we could make... <laughs> 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 oh, I like this. Uh, we can make each card span three rows of our original grid, and then we can use grid template rows with a value of subgrid so that they will inherit the parent grid. And the other thing is we can actually override the gap value within our subgrid. So if you can imagine we have a grid of cards, we have some more like above and below these two, we want to maintain a row gap between them. But within the cards themselves, we you know, perhaps don't need that gap anymore, so we can override it and set the gap to zero. Now, if a browser doesn't support subgrid, all that's going to happen with these cards is they're just not going to look quite as harmonious. Um, I would argue that's not a huge problem here. A user can st still you know, perceive that content and understand it perfectly well, despite it not being exactly as designed. But if that's not good enough, and you know, in some situations it may not be, you might need to um, provide a fallback, and the best way to do that is with a feature query. Um, so you can um, put your, car your code for browsers that support subgrid within this um, feature query, and browsers that don't support subgrid, um, you know, put the code in the code block above. Uh, so, yep, that all works fine. Um, that's kind of the most common or obvious use case, but there are also plenty of other cases where it could be useful too. So in this grid component, we want the fig caption to align with the heading, but, uh, oh yeah, so this is how the grid looks if we inspect it, and we can also s inspect um, subgrids um, in Firefox as well, possibly in Chrome. I'm sure someone will tell me, um, Jay perhaps. <laughs> um, but the problem is the fig caption is a child of the figure. Um, so we need to align it to the same grid as its parent and be aware of the other grid items so that if the text on the right is longer, it's not gonna crash into our fig caption. So we can set a subgrid on the figure and this time we're going to use the row and column axis with the value of subgrid and then we can position the image and the fig caption on the subgrid because they're direct children of that figure. So this way, if the text content on the right is longer, all that's going to happen is that the, that grid track will grow taller. It's not going to crash into our fig caption. Now, another thing I'm pretty excited about is the has pseudo class or parent selector. So again, we can zoom through this because Jay has already um, covered this in part. So this um, can help us with a whole lot of different issues, but let's take a look at what it can help us achieve with our layouts. So we could show a different layout for a component depending on whether or not a particular element is present. So we might have a grid component with a block quote that we position like this with the text centered. Um, or if that quote has a, an accompanying image, then we can actually do like an entirely different grid layout um, and maybe align our text to the left or something else. So you, know, you can imagine also you know, if a figure has a fig caption or not, you could do something completely different with the layout which is fun. So let's zoom back over to the browser uh, and see that in action. Okay, cool, we have mirroring, good stuff. Okay, so you know what would be kind of nice with this layout is um, when we have just three items or an odd number of items on the left, instead of having like this little guy at the bottom just dangling on his own, um, perhaps you know we might want to make the first item in that grid span two columns so it lo all looks nice and even. So let's do that with has. So we're going to do that inside our container query uh, where we've got our two column layout, and we're going to say if our grid has um, a last child uh, which has an odd number, oh, and it's also direct last child, otherwise it all goes wrong, 
<laughs> we're going to style that first child. This is where I make a major typo and nothing works. <laughs> Grid column. We're going to make that span two columns. And it does. <laughs> And because we've set the fluid sizes on our typography and our padding, that scales to and looks completely awesome. <laughs> so um, another quick demo with has just because it's fun. Here's a little thing I made earlier. Um, this is <laughs> you know, all my favorite things in one grid. Um, if we hover on any of these items, so this is actually um, changing the grid itself because we now have animated grid tracks. <laughs> in Chrome, in uh, Safari, and also in Firefox. I think they're everywhere now, which, yay, exciting. So, yay, we can do this and actually change the grid layout. So, um, that's just one of the possibilities for has. Um, and you can, you know, you can imagine you might be able to do something pretty cool, like with a kind of fly-out menu, or like when you hover or click on something. I don't know. Lots of possibilities. Um, we're just kind of scratching the surface here. So, last things, uh, browser support for has. Uh, again, everyone except Firefox. <laughs> Firefox. Firefox needs to get its skates on, I think. But um, yes, it is coming to Firefox. Um, works, but yeah, works in all the other browsers, which is very nice. Um, but if you want to kind of, um, oh yeah, also, Sorry, I haven't got my notes here because I couldn't be bothered to toggle the mirroring again. <laughs> so, <laughs> freestyling. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you can actually use um, at, at support selector to detect whether a browser support has. Um, so, that's very nice. You can tell um, whether the browser support a certain selector and um, do some, you know, provide some fallback code for those that don't. Um, and if you are interested in it and what browsers support um, which features, um, I'd re I recommend checking out the Interop dashboard. So um, this is a uh, sort of cross-browser collaborative project. The browsers agreed on um, a bunch of priority features um, that they're going to uh, work to implement. And you can keep track here of which browsers is, uh, you know, implementing them and which versions and which, you know, the web platform tests that they're passing. So that gives you a good idea of how soon you can expect these new features to land. Uh, so thank you. We got through it. <laughs> um, <laughs> here's my Twitter. <laughs> Sorry about all the tech issues. <laughs> and thank you to Dave, Janestra, um, Chris.